Howard Wallace and Willimon, Resident Aliens. This is an ancient book, right? What's the copyright on this thing? Yeah, wow, 89. I was two. You guys were just little tots or I was, I was a twinkle that. in the eye of your parents. Not even. <laughs> or less. So, why are we reading this ancient book? Because nobody's still listening to it. Busy work. <laughs> That's exactly right. One more writing assignment. All right, so what'd you think of Howard Wasson Willeman? I was kind of bummed that this has been out for 27 years and the church hasn't paid much attention All right. to it. Okay. I think that would be a fair reaction. Okay. There's way too many liberal theologians for us to pay attention to. <laughs> What's that now? He quotes way too many oh, liberal oh, theologians oh. for us to pay attention well, to. Well, that's, that's probably true. So we can't learn anything because he's quoting liberal politicians. Probably. Theologians. Yeah. 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 Uh, Wasn't that the point? <laughs> oh, we'll see. I'll look forward to that paper. <laughs> Andy. Josh. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I know. Andy had his hand. Josh, yes, please election. go ahead. Great for election season. Great for election season. Why is that? Uh, talk about Christian faith in terms of politics. All right. Now, there are several things going on in here. So, are you guys liking this generally, or is this kind of a waste of time? <laughs> How many of you have read Howard Wasp before? Yeah, it's only a handful. So this is this is one of the reasons why I assigned this book because I want you to know Howard Wasp. I want you to meet him. And um, Willeman, anybody ready? Except by Willeman. All right, so Willeman's the practical guy. He's the preacher. He's um, considered an outstanding preacher. He's been doing that for a long time. These guys are both still at Duke Divinity School together, and that's where they are. So Willeman's kind of the preacher, nice guy. So the, the nice stories in here were probably from Willeman. The um, stuff that makes you go, er, that's how it was. Um, <laughs> it's no doubt about it. You can just almost, well, Stanley wrote that, and Willeman wrote that. So the nice stuff is coming from Willeman, by and large. Um, so these guys collaborated on this thing, and so, it, but I, I give Howard Wass a lot of credit for what's driving this, because this is a very typical piece from Howard Wass. Um, Howard Wass has been working now in the church for a long time. He's close to emerit. He, I think he might be officially emeritus status now at Duke, but he's still going full tilt. He's a remarkable individual. Um, he's written extensively extensively. Rarely does he write book-length book length things. He tends to write essays, and they, he writes a year's worth of essays. They throw them together in a book and publish them. And so he's got so many books out. Um, I've taught a class here, a 800-level class, where we read Howard Wass, and we read 3,500 pages, and it doesn't even make a dent. He's got so much stuff, okay? So there's a, there's a lot that he's done, and a lot of he's thought about things, and he's always provocative, like you get here. The reason this book is helpful is because this is his most accessible book. It's, if you're going to try to get into Howard Wasp, this is where you start. And people say, what else should I read next? Wow, it's like there's a big leap between this and the, and the next thing. Um, but Howard Wasp is, is worth reading always carefully. He's, you can't just take him straight value because he's an interesting kind of guy. And you probably got that sense reading this. Um, are you reading along with him thinking, cool, cool, cool. Then all of a sudden he throws a curveball. I think, oh, I don't know about that. And you read some more, oh, that's cool. Oh, that's awesome. And you're like, oh, what's that? And he, right? I mean, this is, this is the way he is. And so he's, he's kind of this enigma. He, he exemplifies what has been called postmodernity. Um, and people put him in that school, but he rejects the term. He doesn't believe in postmodernity. He mocks it. And so, you know, people who are now being cool, I'm postmodern, I'm so cool, I'm postmodern. He just ridicules that. It's just nonsense. But um, he does reject liberalism, and he pushes hard against that. Um, he's very Barthian and follows um, that, the, the teaching of Barth and was very influenced by him. He came out of the Yale School, and the Yale School was kind of hatching this thing known as postmodernity. So if you know a little bit about postliberalism, postmodernity, a lot of it is tied to the Yale School. Howard Wass came out of that. Um, William Plaker, remember him from Systems One, Domestication of Transcendence? Oh, man. Well, I didn't have you. He, well, others would use him too. Um, Plaker also um, came out of that school, and there were others who were part of that. And so there, there's, there's a whole you know, generation of people out there, and then there's the, second, the next generation who have been learning from these guys. In um, 2001, the September 11th issue of Time magazine um, declared him to be America's best theologian. And when Howard Ross heard that, he said, what does Time Magazine know about theologians? You know, and his, his answer was, best is not a theological category. So he's just, 
that's, that's Howard Loss. He's dis- dismissive of these kinds of things. Now, that's a little bit about where he's coming from. So he was raised as a, tech, as a bricklayer's son in Texas, Methodist, went to a Methodist undergrad school, did his grad work at Yale, taught at Augustana College with the Lutherans for a while, ended up at Notre Dame, and was very influenced by Catholicism, loves the liturgy, as you picked up on that, um, loves the church. Also started reading John Howard Yoder, who was a Mennonite. So Howard Loss became convinced that to be Christian and to follow Christ is to be nonviolent, and he's absolutely committed to this. And so it's a full-throated pacifism, but it's not a soft liberal pacifism. This is a follow Jesus. Jesus turns you the cheek. That's what you got to do. And so that's where Howard Watts comes down. And then now he's um, teaching at um, Duke, and he's married to an Anglican priestess, and so he's got that too going on. So yeah, he's all over the place. And be fun. just yeah. So just when you think you kind of got Howard Ross figured out, he throws you another curveball, and he's, he's fascinating. So we can talk a lot more about him, but we don't, I don't want to detract too much from this. Now, one of the things he's talking about in this book a lot is he's talking about politics. And this usually confuses people right off the bat. Because we hear politics, we think about the world, you know, Democrat, Republican. Or we think about the church, and we think about the right-wing faction fighting against the left-wing faction, and we think about politics. And almost always, we think about politics in a decidedly negative way. And we have a negative attitude. And you'll even hear people in the church, and a lot of pastors whine and moan, oh, there's too much politics in the church. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, my, my response to that is, yeah, they're people. What do you expect? Um, when you put two people together, are you going to have politics involved? Yes. Because... They're going to have different ways of seeing things. Now, that's on the negative side. But what does Howard Walsh mean when he talks about the politics? So he's connecting it to Poldus, like yes. the heavenly city versus the all right. city. Or so yeah, he, is, he is going all the way back to a fundamental Greek definition of the polis. And the polis, of course, is the city-state. And probably the term I would use more helpfully might even be a community. And so the politics is simply describing the life of this polis, the life of this community. And so when he talks about the church as a politics, what's he getting at? He's talking about the church as a community that has a life together and that has a way of doing things and has a culture all its own. There is a way of being that goes with this, and that's the politics. All right? So that's a big part of this, and that's one of the definitions, the terms he's using a lot, and it confuses people because they think, what's he doing here? And so what he's really doing is he's saying the church exists as a community with its own politics, and, and here's one of the key ideas, the church is by definition always at odds with the politics of the world around. And this is the fundamental divide for Howard Loss, because Howard, this is where the, his Mennonite roots come through, or his Mennonite learning comes through, and he is con- fully convic- convinced of this, that to follow Christ means you've got to be like Christ. Christ rejects violence. Christ rejects self-assertion. Christ rejects manipulation. Christ rejects individualism. Christ is embracing instead the responsibility we have towards one another, this different kind of life, a life of peace, a life of turning of the cheek, a life of declaring and bringing the gospel to people. And that's what the church must embody and live. The world is, by definition for Howard Loss, always founded on the sword, always premised on violence, whether that is actual physical violence or just even verbal or emotional violence. It's always about games and authority and one-upping people. That's the world's politics. And so for Howard Wash, you have this sharp divide between church's politics and the world's politics. And in this story, he's being quite Augustinian, okay? Um, the idea of the, the, the kind of the two cities of God, all right? And, but for Howard Wash, the world is just an inherently negative, bad place. Um, that's why a lot of people will lump him into the category of neo-anabaptism. And yeah, he... He exemplifies that. He is the figurehead for that whole idea. That's how or loss. So that's a part of what, what's going on in here. So just to clarify. Is that, okay? Bring a little clarity to some of this. Now, another key term that he talks about a lot, again, is Constantinianism. And this word shows up more than once. <clears throat> how many of you have encountered this word somewhere along the way? All right, good. So what is Constantinianism? Yeah, Adam? It's just the, the church's uh, partnership or um, submission to the world around us as it is. All right. In large part under Constantine and the legalization of Christianity. All right. 
So Constantinianism is now a term used to describe, especially as Hauerwas uses it, this is a term used to describe the unholy alliance between church and state. Okay, so this is the, and unholy is the kind of the key idea here, the unholy alliance between church and state. Now, Hauerwas has a definite agenda going here. Um, and that's why he would call it an unholy alliance between church and state. But Constantinianism has a long history, and it goes all the way back to Constantine. Constantine. And so what do you remember about Constantine? He legalized Christianity. All right. Well, he made Christianity no longer illegal. Okay. And then the, so then the, and then the Edict of Milan you know, issued, okay, we're not going to persecute Christians anymore. And then next generation made it actually the, 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 the national religion. So Constantine uh, makes religion okay, makes Christianity okay. His mother and wife were actually quite devout Christians. Constantine's own commitment to the faith is always kind of questionable. People will debate that. They sometimes suggest he might have just been an opportunist who recognized to say in hoc signo in case is really good because now I can claim Jesus as my guy and everybody else likes Jesus, so good, I'll be the new popular leader. Remember, he's the one who saw the sign of the cross emblazoned in the heavens before the battle of the Milven Bridge and he put it on his shields and into battle he goes and triumphs. And so Jesus wins. So that's Constantine. Now, Constantine also did another cool thing. In 325, we have an issue going in the, in the empire. The empire is getting divided. The very thing that Constantine thought was going to unify it is dividing. What's the issue? Arius. Oh no, Christianity is being threatened. The one thing that Constantine thought was going to hold his empire together is starting to fracture the empire. We've got to get this fixed. So who pays the bill for the Council of Nicaea? Constantine does. Yeah, he foot the bill. That's the beginning of Constantinianism. So when the bishops all get, get together at Nicaea in 325 to deal with Arius, Constantine is the one who calls the council and pays for it. Hey, you Christians, get your act together. Get this figured out. And I don't frankly care who wins, whether it's Athanasius or Arius, just settle it. Seriously. This is where he's coming from. In fact, if he had his druthers, he probably would have gone with Arius because he was kind of the majority position and be easier. But it doesn't matter to him. Just get it settled. Now, this marks the beginning of Constantinianism, which is the, basically the state stepping in and helping out the church. Why might some people say, that's a really good thing? Well, at least they're not killing us anymore. Because before this, you were a Christian, you might get dragged off to the Colosseum and fed to a lion or torched for a garden party. Mm. So now we're not being killed. That's cool. So Constantinianism, really good for the church. But Hauerwas says, no. Why? Tames the church. All right. Constantinianism changes the church. And this is Hauerwas' argument. The Constantinianism is a markedly bad thing. Because as soon as the church comes into cozy alliance with the state, it compromises its own politics. And it starts to redefine itself in light of the state instead of being who it is. This is his complaint about Constantinianism. And he says, this is why this is an unholy thing. It's wrong because it changes the church. And the state is not hurt by this, but the church is profoundly hurt by this. This is the complaint of Constantinianism. And Howard Wass is merciless in pressing this attack. All right, now that's why he says, for him, Constantinianism ended when? Yes, in fact, it was when his own hometown opened the theater on Sunday afternoon. Everything changed. Why? Everything was closed on Sunday. Yeah, this was known as the Blue Laws. So in the old days, you had these blue laws, and the blue laws are basically the state saying, um, we have these rules, and they're going to be in place because we think this is a good idea. Well, why do you think that's a good idea? Well, because we all happen to be Baptists, and we don't want you to drink alcohol on Sundays. And I just remember when I was a student here, um, not that long ago, when you go over to Schnucks on a Sunday morning or like around noon, they'd have a little yellow chain across the liquor aisle, and you couldn't go down it because that was... Sunday morning. You're supposed to be in church. And so you couldn't buy any alcohol until Sunday afternoon. You had to wait. So that's a leftover blue law. And there are still some counties in the country in the South that are dry counties. That's a blue law. So anytime you have the state making a law, which is basically not doing anything for the sake of the state, but if it's for the sake of the church, because the church has some agenda, that's a blue law. And that's an example of Constantinianism. Okay? 
Now, Howard Wasser's argument is that this hurts the church. Do you think that's true? Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. You don't think it's true? No. Okay. okay. So, this is one of these interesting things we can talk about, but let me put it to you this way. Has Constantinianism now completely disappeared from the culture in America? No, not entirely. In fact, there are still quite a few examples around. We don't have the situation they have in Europe where you have the state paying for the church, which they still do. That's clearly Constantinianism. So here we have the state separated from the church. Oh, we're not Constantinian them. But we do still rely on the state, don't we? Adam? Well, even with this election, the number of people who said, I'm going to vote for a specific candidate because of the uh, uh, Supreme Court justices they're going to appoint, and that's my only reason for voting for them, and that's Constantinius. Well, there's a Constantinian element to that, maybe. Maybe. We can come back to that one if we have time. Because that one's really more an example of a Christian trying to say, what's my responsibility in the, in the temporal realm? And if I can try to make it, the temporal realm a little more just, I need to try to do that. And that's not necessarily Constantinian. That's just simply trying to live out your faith. Constantinianism is when the person says, I want to get the right person in power so that he gives me my rights or keeps on extending my, my break that I need. Free to be fit. Well, perhaps. Right, so, that was what I was going to say. That Mark, the, the bid to, from Donald Trump to the evangelical voters is, you guys aren't afraid. You don't, you don't have any power. I'll give you power. And then we have a problem if that's what's going on here. And so if it's a tit-for-tat kind of a thing, that starts to smell like Constantinianism. Probably the best example I can give you of Constantinianism and its reach, and this maybe will convince you, Stephen, of the problem with this is, is the whole idea of tax-exempt status. Tax-exempt status is Constantinianism because the fact that the church gets a buy on having to pay their taxes is a nice break. Where does the state come up with that idea? Is that required? It's just their idea. The state decided, we'll give the church a break because we think the church is a force for good by and large, so we'll give them a break. That's a handout coming from the government. It is. So the church is, is dependent upon the state for that tax-exempt status. It is not the church's inherent rights. And don't even get me started on that. Okay, because there are no inherent rights. And the church can't ever go walking out into the temple and say, you owe it to us because we're the church. Give me a break. Shut up. You can never make that kind of a claim. Church can't do that. So, Constantinianism shows up when we have tax exempt status, and here's where it's negative. How many times have you heard it suggested, and you probably heard it with your own ears or said it with your own mouth, oh, pastor, you're getting a little too political. You can't do that. We might lose our tax exempt status. And as soon as you have heard that or said that, guess what? You have just witnessed the negative side of Constantinianism. Because if the church changes its message or bites back on its message or tailors its message to keep its tax-exempt status, guess what? It's just been changed by the state, hasn't it? The state has just kept it a little more compliant, a little more docile, a little more in its back pocket. It's exactly what Constantinianism is going on, and that's exactly why Howard Walsh rejects it. Because the state ends up cozying up to the church, and the church becomes reliant and compliant, and it doesn't want to jeopardize that relationship. So in order to maintain the relationship, you just have to put up with some stuff so we can keep our nice privileged position. And then does the church then continue to be faithful in speaking what the church needs to speak? And Howard Walsh says, no, does not. It begins to compromise and begins to fold on what it needs to say. And so a great example of this is all the churches right now who are trying to decide how much should we really say from the pulpit about homosexuality. That's going to provoke some people. Is God's teaching on this clear cut? Yep. Yeah, but we don't really need to go there, do we? Maybe we can just kind of back off a little bit. And so you start backing off. Why? For the sake of popularity or favors from the state or whatever. That's an example of Constantinianism. It's still very much alive, and it's one of the things that Howard Watts is very concerned about. Okay, Nicholas. I think also in the very early church we can see it, that there was not any more uh, Christian persecution after Constantine rises to the church, but there were the theological persecution, mm -hmm. because everybody who hurts the unity by right the theology is going to send to exile because it's uh, the unity 
pricing <coughs> of content units. Right, which is precisely what happens to Athanasius. So Athanasius prevails at Nicaea and then spends the rest of his life in exile because nobody wants to listen to him. And so you begin to have the problems that come internally, right? And so this is precisely the problem. Now, what's interesting is Harawas would argue then, so Constantinianism starts in 325 and is still going on. And so when he sees the unraveling of this Constantinian alliance, he's not moaning and complaining, he is applauding and cheering it on. Bring it faster. Singing hallelujahs. That's right. This is what he would say. And so what Harawas would say is, when the state takes away the church's tax-exempt status, good, finally. At last, you need this. And that's how it was. Now, I will admit quite openly and candidly, I think he's right. And I would tend to agree with this. And you might say, oh, that's going to do in incalculable damage to the church. Wait a minute. We're going to have to maybe give up some property? Probably. Yeah, probably lose a lot of property. Okay? Um, that's going to happen. A lot of churches aren't going to be able to pay their taxes. And we're not talking 10% sales tax on the Dixie cups you buy for the youth group. Okay? You know, you all, as vicars, had to carry a little tax-exempt status letter, right? Some of you, yeah. I mean, yes, you know what I'm talking about. Walmart. Or DCEs, yeah. Go to Walmart and buy supplies. Here's my tax-exempt status there. I just saved three bucks. Whew, cool. You know, that's not what we're talking about here. What we're talking about is property tax on some of these old buildings in these choice neighborhoods. And we're talking about property tax on 82 acres in Clayton. Think we'll stay open here? No, <laughs> ain't going to happen. Yeah, uh, it's, it's just the uh, Clayton is just gonna go. Oh, you're taxable. <laughs> cool. Here's your bill. Whoa. So that's what we're talking about. So this is gonna cause. It's gonna be hugely detrimental. But yet, what are we talking about here? This is Christ's church for crying out loud. Is the church gonna fold because the state becomes a little bit unfriendly? So this is where we need to get some perspective. And that's why I like Hauerwas, because he brings us back to, wait a minute, are you thinking like the church or like some stupid organization in the world trying to defend its rights? What are you doing here? And what I love about Hauerwas, and what I think I'm hoping you guys picked up on is he's calling the church to act like the church. And that's pretty cool. And that is something I want you guys to take with you when you leave this place. Let's have the goal of having the church act like the church. What a crazy thought. And instead of the church just being a country club or a nice gathering place on Sundays or a place to go before brunch when we're all dressed up like McChurch, maybe we should act like the church. And when you start to see a guy like Hauerwas and Wolleman kind of saying the same things that a guy like Kurt Marquardt is saying, you think the weird world we're living in because Howard Wallace and Marquardt have like nothing in common. And yet, they're both seeing clearly that there is a culture to the life of the church. Because that's what we're talking about, the church having a politics. The church has a culture, all its own. And it doesn't run around trying to figure out what it can learn from the world around it. It's got its own culture, and its own way of doing things, and its own way of living. And it's not ashamed of it, not embarrassed by it. And when you start seeing a guy like Marquardt and Howard Wallace agreeing, you start thinking, perhaps they're right about this. And see, Howard Wass is also one of these guys who just loves the liturgy, loves it, and extols it, that this is how God comes to us. And he thinks that the, the practice of the church and its faithfulness is so important. He, he was on campus here um, in 2002, in the spring of the year after, the, after the, the attacks in New York and Philadelphia, in New York and, yeah, and in um, D.C. So he was, he was on campus here, and um, remarkable. Um, He's, always, he's quite entertaining. Uh, I had the privilege of getting to pick him up at the airport because I was a grad student and I haven't been reading Howard Wasser. Why don't you go pick him up? Okay, cool. So I got to do that. So I got to drive him between the airport and here and talk with him a little bit. And um, he, he is um, just merciless in his um, attacks on the Constantinianism stuff because there were all the flags were still in all the cars then, you know, all the patriotism was going, you know. And um, so we pulled into the parking lot and the parking lot was filled with all the little flags, you know, our seminary parking lot. And I said something to him about him. Yeah, and all the flags are here. And I said, yeah, isn't it disgusting? <laughs> I thought, yeah, you're, you're going to have a fun time with these guys, Stanley, here. <laughs> and so, and, um, so that was just the tip of the iceberg. You know? So it was fun. Um, but then he made some comment about, um, wow, coming to this campus, it's quite remarkable. I've, I've heard about this place. I've heard about these Missouri Senate people. But to know you exist, it's like coming to a, a myth and seeing it as real. You know? <laughs> so it was kind of delightful. So he has a high regard for us. But then we were talking about something, and he said something about 
church growth stuff. And I said, well, yeah, we've, we've kind of dealt with that here too. Said, You've had that in your church body? He was, he was aghast, scandalized to think that we would have stooped so low as to be doing church growth stuff. He couldn't believe it. He was, he was embarrassed for us. <laughs> so, you see, this is kind of where he's coming from. This is the kind of guy he is. He, he's, he's something else. But what he's calling us to do is to be the church. To be the church. And that's what Mark Wart's been calling you to do too. Be the church. What's it mean to be the church? What's it mean to be this wild people of God that takes God's polis seriously and lives with a politics that is an affront to the world around you. That's what he's calling you to do. And if you guys take this seriously, it's going to blow you away. And it's going to drive your ministry further until the day you die because you're never going to get tired of trying to do this because it just overwhelms you. And I want you to bite this and get into this. That's what I want for you. Adam. Due to the decline in our synod uh, and the likely future decline based on our general age at the moment, uh, many of us might receive calls to congregations that have buildings that uh, we don't need for the size and the space. True. And would you say that because this day is coming when even the last little fragments of Constantinianism, like tax status, um, may be lost or taken from mm-hmm. us, we should early on begin saying let's sell buildings and yeah you know there's that's part of the reality and i think it's it's it would be wise for a congregation to ask hard questions about what its future needs to be and what we're trying to do um and start and think talking seriously about contingency plans when we when we lose tax exempt status and not when if it's when um i'm not quite the to the alarmist that some guys are i mean you know when the whole obergefell thing came out we had congregations you know Oh, we're going to do this, we're going to do this, and start, you know, passing all this new constitutional stuff about what weddings we'll do and stuff. You know, you don't need to overreact. Um, while I think the day will certainly come when tax exempt status will be taken from us, I think it'll happen. It's not going to happen for a while. There's still too many people, too much influence, and too many people who are sympathetic. It's not going to happen for a while, but it will. Um, so in other words, I don't, I don't see it happening, frankly, in my lifetime. I really don't. I and mean, if it did, I'd be surprised. It's possible. You know, it's possible that things go that quickly. You know, anything's possible. But um, I don't see it happening that fast. But it, it will happen, I, I'm, unless America goes down first. I mean, but it, it will happen. One of the two things will happen. Yeah, Nicholas. Uh, another thing would, could, which could happen, which in Germany happened in the 19th century, that, like, the church will, um, they can stay with this uh, excellence, but they have to, you know, figure kind of their theology. If they're going to keep on getting supported by the state, they've got to cooperate with the state. And so the, the state church becomes a little different than it used to be. And this reaches its pinnacle, of course, with the rise of the Third Reich and the church just becoming compliant to whatever they need to do. And that's the ultimate shame of Constantinianism. And what, what we uh, experienced in Germany was after 300 years after uh, was very close connections with, with the Lutheran church and the state and then unionism rise, mm-hmm. and they, you are, it, um, people get so afraid of losing their privileges, mm-hmm. and you would see how weak the church was. Exactly. It was one percent, two percent of the Lutheran church who confessed a state was a fake. Exactly. And the the kind of hard lessons you watch of Germany in the 30s and the Deutsch Kirsten and the Confessing Church. There's a lot to be learned from that. And those are hard, hard, bitter lessons. But we also have to be very careful that we don't go to the other extreme and start becoming kind of separatists of you know, state evil. That's not true either. And that's where Howard Wass is good, but see, Howard Wass is not a Lutheran. And I will take him so far that I'm gonna say, no, you're wrong about that. And I'll point out several other things where I think he's wrong. And that's one of the areas where he's wrong, is the state is still God's good creation. And if you need some more clarity on this, read the book that's coming out in the spring. Right. Waiting for the plug. <laughs> I was waiting for it in this class. <laughs> Who's the author? Some guy you're somewhat familiar with. <laughs> is it Howard Walls? <laughs> All right. Is, that, is it Howard Walls? No, not that one. No. He's got other ones. You can read him anytime you want. All right, good. Now, so you get in the sense of this and we're, we're, what Howard Walls is calling you to do. And I would say that is probably the overall, the overarching theme of this entire book is let the church be faithful to its polis. Let it be who it needs to be. And that's why he'll say things like, the church doesn't have a social ethic. The church is a social ethic. Okay, you get that? So you don't, the church doesn't have a social ethic. It simply is. If the church is just being itself, it's being that. And then what does he say is the, the most important thing the church can do for the sake of the world? What is it? What would it be? He talks about this in the book a little bit. 
it's not as explicit as it is in other places, but what's the most important thing the church can do for the sake of the world? Exactly. Be the church. Be the church. And what's he mean by that? Does he mean, oh, okay, open an office in Washington, D.C. and make sure we're influencing all the, um, the policy things that go through the House of Representatives? Is that what he's talking about? No. No. So is he talking about, oh, yeah, we're going for- to organize boycotts and we're going to force our voice to be heard and we're going sh- to flex our big muscle and we're going to boycott Disney and we're going to shut them down because they're for-, they're for gay people. Is that what he's talking about? No. That's Star Wars. No. So what's, what's he mean? What's he mean by the church needs to be the church? What's he talking about? I picked up and proclaimed the truth of the gospel, live the life according to the gospel, and the, wor- you know, the world will change if it changes, and if it doesn't change, it doesn't change. But, you know, you have to live the life of the gospel. All know? right. So Either this is... In right. your world, in he your says, colony. <laughs> in your colony. He says in another place, the most important thing that the church does for the sake of the world is to celebrate the Eucharist. Isn't that cool? Because this is when the church is being true, the most true to itself and what it is. And it's living that narrative and it's being who it is. And it's telling the world, this is the most important thing. Not who wins elections, not who's got power, not who's keeping our tax exempt status. That stuff doesn't matter. What matters is this reality of Christ present for us here. This is the one reality that matters. And so the story of the church is the story of God in the world. And when the church lives and tells that story faithfully and without apology, that's what makes an impact. That's what helps the world figure out what it means to be the world. And when the church looks really different, and we take care of ourselves, and we're not looking out for our own interest, and we're not appealing to the government to try to get special breaks or to try to get our fair share. When we don't do that, we are a mystery to the world. And people look at us, and they scratch their head and think, what's with those people? They're weird. And when that starts to happen, now you know the church is on track. And that's why he calls the church to be different, nonviolent, not asserting its rights. And that's the thing. Now, the whole nonviolent thing is complicated because as Lutherans, we believe firmly in the whole idea of vocation and doing what I need to do for the sake of others. So I don't wield the sword for myself, but to defend my neighbor, I do, because that's one of my vocations in the temporal realm. And you should be able to sort that out with some clarity when you think back to the two realms and how these things operate, okay? That's where Howard Ross and I will part company. But his idea of the church not asserting its rights, not defending itself, Turning you the cheek, he's exactly right about this. And this is what the church needs to start paying attention to, and that's what he's calling for. Okay? All right, Adam. I should probably have picked up on this in other classes with you, but with that not defending your or uh, not defending yourself for your own sake, but the sake of your neighbor, does that apply only if your neighbor's not Christian or even the sake of your No, it applies even for your sake of your Christian neighbor and you're doing your vocation for them. But see that's where you have to be a little bit careful because, you know, So I've got a friend who's a Christian neighbor and he's losing his job because he won't make a cake for some gay couple. And so I'm going to go to court and defend his rights to not do that. Now now you're starting to confuse things a little bit because now you're going for a larger principle and you're trying to defend that larger principle in court and you're missing the point. And so the better thing to do is he's, he's lost his job. Well, I'll help him find a new job or he can come live with me for a while until he gets on his feet again and we'll get this figured out. So in other words, you don't go trying to defend his rights. You figure out how to be the church for him. And then again, you're witnessing to the world rather remarkably. Okay? All right. Now, so we've got about 30 minutes left. I'll let you have the agenda for the last part of this. What are some of the things that stuck out to you that you really liked or didn't like or things that were perplexing? We can field your individual issues here. There are some things in here that are just awesome, and I hope you will call attention to some of these my my favorite quotes. There's a bunch in here. Um, Towards the end of the book, uh, one of the areas that I really enjoyed was... uh, it must have been Willem in those writing it, where he's talking about the, <laughs> the role of pastor. The what? The role of pastor. Yeah. And he's talking about how so many people in so many churches view the role of a pastor as kind of just this helping profession. Right. And what that does to the pastor. Yes. And uh, it was just kind of cool because I've heard so much about burnout. Yep. Um, my grandfather was a pastor, and I think there was some of that going on as well. And um, I always hear, like, oh, you make sure you take a day out. Make sure you set boundaries. And, 
Uh, what I heard in the book, which really <coughs> stuck out to me, was it's less to do about that and more to do about the actual what is the pastor, what is the, exactly. what is the view of the pastor, what exactly. is the doing. And this is, this is becoming quite P stuff, but this is really good. And he, he, the way, and this is not presented all at one time in the book. It's kind of, he hits it and comes back to it a couple different times. But this is so important. So he, he stresses this, and this is one of the key things I do want to get to. The pastoral office is not a helping profession. You are not there to help people. Okay? You've got to get this, guys. And it, it flays me that you guys will graduate not knowing this and thinking, I'm out there to help people. If you enter into the office of the ministry trying to help people, you will burn yourself out. You will. You'll go nuts because people's appetites for help are insatiable. Insatiable. Trust me on this, man. Oh, you're not going to believe what people are going to do and how hungry they are. And you start giving them a little help. Oh, man, they're going to find more and more things they need help with. And I'm not just talking material help. You know, help with my marriage, help figuring this out. You know, I need to talk to some more passion. We need to take this out. It just never ends. And if you think you're there to help them, you're going to go nuts because you will never get to the end of the day and say, there, I, think I helped everybody today. You can't. So you've got to get some clarity here. So what does Howard Wass, what did Howard Wass and Wellman argue? What is the purpose of a church, of, the, of a pastor? What's his purpose? Truth. Point people back to God. Yeah. To point people to God, to teach them to be disciples. That's your purpose. And see, that's very different than helping them. Now, ultimately, that's the ultimate help they need. They don't know that, but you know that. So your goal is to make disciples, not just to meet needs. And if you're out there trying to meet needs, you're going to go nuts. Ain't going to happen. And if you're trying to get your, your, you know, your affirmation because people are you know, affirming you and praising you, you're going to go nuts. You can find your affirmation in only one place. I'm doing what God put me here to do. And if you know that, that'll get you through every day. And if you know that, you're going to get the balance you need and be able to say, okay, I did what I need to do today. I'm done. And I, I, I'm not here to make everybody happy. I can't. And that's not what it, this is all about. So that's critical. I think this is a vital thing. And I think this does have, say a ton to pastoral burnout. Because pastoral burnout, in my opinion, comes from guys having the wrong understanding, the wrong motive, the wrong goals of what they're trying to do in their ministry. That's why it comes. It has little to do with setting boundaries and making sure you have free time. It has to do with your attitude of what you're trying to do. And if you have the attitude, I'm here to live Christ in my wife, in my life, family, with my, in, my life, in my life with my wife and in my family. I'm here to show what it means to be a disciple and I'm here to invite people into this discipleship life. That's what I'm called to do, to preach the gospel, to bring God's truth to them then you can keep your perspective and you realize this is all consuming. There's never a time when you're not doing this. And then you can just go forward and say, how much of my life is in the pastoral office? Every bit of it. When do I stop being a pastor? Never. So can I go home and goof around with my kids tonight? Absolutely. And is there one more shut-in call I should make? Yeah, probably. They'll, they'll be there tomorrow. And my kids need me tonight. If they're not, then you'll, they're not, you'll see them. You'll just take care of the funeral then. It's cool. And so... Um, you get, you, that's just where the balance comes in. It's, just, it's an attitudinal thing. And I, I don't think ruthless schedule setting is that critically important. Far more important is how you understand what you're doing and what your role is. And that brings you far more balance. So, and we can talk more about that. But that's kind of, like I said, that's exceedingly P stuff. But this reminds me then also of what a pastor should do. And this is one of my favorite quotes, so I'm going to give it to you because I don't want to miss this one. Page 167 tail end of the book. And this is his, in his new session. He writes, Earlier we noted how the church is dying a slow death at the hands of pastors who are nice. Pastors who are themselves miserable because they are attempting to help people with no basis for that help and no safeguard for themselves other than their desire to be nice and help people. <laughs> so many pastors. Indeed, one of us, read Howard Wass, is tempted to think that there is not much wrong with the church that could not be cured by God calling about a hundred really insensitive, uncaring, and offensive people into the ministry. <laughs> love that. I love that. And that's how I get out of the seminary. <laughs> <laughs> You're one of them. Now we need only 99 more. All right. So, and I think he's, you get the idea. Now you don't need to go out and be a jerk, but the idea that, you know, I'm here to talk God's truth to people, and I'm here to call people to this new way of life. I'm not here to help you and make and be nice. That's not what I'm here to do. And if you keep that straight, it helps you so much in just how you carry out your ministry and what you do and don't do. All right. Piggybacking off of this entire conversation, my favorite quote from the book was uh, about pastors that are trying to be helpful, and everybody starts, you know, kind of taking their time away. It says it's like being uh, nibbled to death by ducks. Mm -hmm. It really kind of drove it home for me because I, I don't know, I, I read and I feel and yeah. I could just feel them 
nipping away at my yeah, neck. Yeah, and uh, yeah, uh, time management is going to have to be a skill that I, I grow right. out there. Good. Yeah. Happy. I thought the brief section about confirmation. Uh, All right, that's yeah. another huge highlight in here. Why are we doing it? Uh, having taught confirmation for years and been a part of the writing of the curriculum, this was just so like, man, we missed the boat with all these things because all the problems he points out, this is what happens if you don't do it this way. Right. Or the problems we were still trying to face, going, how do we fix that? How do right. we change that? And you have to back up and ask the fundamental question, what are we trying to accomplish here? What's the, what's the goal? What are we trying to make? We're trying to make people who are following Christ, how are we gonna do that? And are we gonna do that by curriculum? Or are we gonna do that by a way of life and inviting people into that? It's, it's, it changes how you think about the whole, the whole thing. And the, the delightful story he talks about, the, the mentor program they set up and how the kid holds the mentor accountable. You know, that's pretty cool. There's the church being the church. You know, I didn't expect that. And, you know, the bizarre thing is, oh, you mean we actually have to live this Christian life? I thought it was just kind of a nice thing we did, you know. But to actually conform your life around these truths, that's what he's calling us to do. And it can be uncomfortable. All right, Nicholas. Well, I, there are two things I really liked. It was the one uh, with the way he talked a lot about telling stories. Mm -hmm. And that was kind of good self-reflection for me because kind of why I'm here because my mother told me the stories in my childhood yes so and um, oh I absolutely right that is uh, that was that was a pretty good thought I th think that we could shape a lot you know with our children and also with yeah new, um, new members right by just, just telling stories yeah no I, I agree completely this whole idea of community is um, just the just a, a small part of a, a huge field of study. And you encounter this a little bit in religious bodies. Next quarter, I know. Um, but this is it's by the work of a guy named Alistair McIntyre. You're not gonna read him next quarter. You had your chance this quarter if you take theological ethics, but most of you didn't do that either. All right, so McIntyre wrote this phenomenal book called After Virtue. And in this book, he talks a lot about what makes a community make a community and why it's important for the sake of ethics. and it's important for just the, the formation of the community. But in a community to function well, you have to have three critical things. And this is not just McIntyre, but others have been thought about this as well. There is a clear creed for that community. There are narratives for that community. And then there are practices for that community. And these things work together to accomplish formation in the community. These things have to be there. And so the church clearly has these things going. And the narratives then become a critical part of this, the stories. Whether the Bible stories or stories about Walter or stories about the loss of the Amelia, you know, all these kinds become part of our story and part of what's going on. And the telling of the narratives is powerful, powerful, because it brings you into that, that community and it forms you to help you know the creed and it habituates you. So this is the, from last conversation we had, the whole idea of habituation. You're habituated into a community, and it happens by doing the practices and doing the narratives, and probably one of the biggest practices we do, of course, would be worship, which is why Howard Wass is a huge fan of liturgy and worship and the forms of the way we do things, because it habituates you and forms you into a community. See, he's not, this is what you have to realize about this, and this is why he, I hope you kind of realize where I'm coming from. It's not a matter of repristination. Um, you familiar with that term? Repristinationism is when you think there's a pristine golden era and we have to recapture that. This is, how it, this is the, how it's supposed to be. Those were the golden days and we need to recapture that. That's repristinationism. That's pretty prevalent in the world, okay? And it's prevalent not just in church circles, but it's out there. And in our circles we have it. So there's the golden age. Was it the golden age of Walther? Or was it the golden age of Peeper? Or was it the golden age a little further back of Gerhard and Kalov? Maybe that was golden age. Maybe it was Luther. And so then you, you pick your golden age and you try to recapture that and start trying to do that. This is nonsense. This is nonsense. And so when I'm talking to you about liturgy and how important it is, I am not advocating repristinationism. I'm not arguing for TLH or further back. I'm not arguing for the traditional forms of worship. I, that's not the point. That's not the point. The point is what kind of community are you forming? That's the point. And see, this is what point Howard Wass is trying to get. What kind of people are you making by your practices? What are you doing? Pay attention. What are you doing for the community? What are you doing for the politics that is the church? Are you 
cutting off your nose to spite your face? Well, we're not going to do liturgy around here. We're going to be cool and avant-garde. Idiot! Idiot! What are you doing? You've just cut off the very thing that makes you what you are. And now you're going to habituate your people into what? Self-serving? Oh, I like that. Makes, my, makes me feel good. Come on! You see, and it's not a matter of style or anything like that. It's a matter of what kind of people are you making? What are you forming them into by how you worship and the narratives you tell or don't tell? Oh, scripture readings are taking way too long. Cut them back. Cut them back. Three verses. That's enough. When do they ever hear the stories? Give me the long stories. Tell the Old Testament narratives. Tell them. Teach the kids in Sunday school the stories. Bible stories. Oh, oh yeah, it's kind of important. Yeah, duh. Man. You see, this is the stuff that matters because you're making a community. You're making the politics. That's what's driving me when I'm telling you to pay attention to this stuff. It's not just because, well, that's what we've always done it. We don't want to be, we don't want to lose what we've always done it. Spare me. That's not the point. That's not the point. It's the reality of what you're making, what kind of people you're making. That's where I get concerned. And that's what, exactly what Howard Washington women are saying. So you just crank through the motions in your confirmation thing. All right, seventh grade, start memorizing the catechism. And then eighth grade year, okay, time for the big party. Let's have our confirmation thing. Yeah, we got all of it. confirmed. And then three years later, you're watching these kids go off, you know, or four years later off to college. And then, oh, they never come home. Huh. And we lost another bunch of them. Oh, well. What are you going to do? The world's really hard. Come on, people. Are we forming them or not? Obviously, the answer is no. No. So if we're not forming them, why aren't we? What's going wrong? Maybe it's how we're being the church. Maybe we're not being the church. See, that's what's at stake here, guys. That's what's going on. And if you can't get excited about that, why are you here? All right. So next up. Um, the part, it kind of dovetails on that where he's talking about um, uh, the morale, you know, moral ethic and how you, de you, know, you develop it. He says, mm -hmm. you know, ethics is first a way of seeing before it is a matter of doing. Yes. And I think, you know, that's, it was kind of, it was a great statement. It was kind of a light bulb moment for me. Yes. And it kind of went back Good. to the Sacramon article. I, I used that, you know, went back to that too because... As a kid, he saw all that stuff go on. Right. And then later on, it was like, oh, that's what he came back to. So the idea of, you know, you can't teach it out of a book. You right. Know, you have to do it. You have to see it. So, you know, the importance of having children in worship, the importance of the liturgy repeated <coughs> over and over. People see it, experience it. Um, you know, and that's how you create that community. And I just, uh, that idea of... You know, like I said, uh, ethics is, you know, a first a way of seeing before doing. I, I just, that really kind of resonated with me is how you create that habit. <clears throat> right. That, yeah. Right. You see, this is what ethics is all about. Ethics is not about knowing which rules to apply at what time. Ethics is about learning how to see the world right. Yeah, you have to see people doing it and then, <coughs> oh, that's what I do. Okay, right. Got it. Right. Yeah. All right. Yes, Andy. I had the experience on Wednesday morning in chapel here of confessing my sins, which I've said in the same words, you know, more than a thousand times, mm -hmm. and having like six or seven phrases jump out at me, simply in light of the election happening the previous night. Ah. And I think there's something to say for that in the sense that in this world where everything is changing, that this is the thing that stays the same. Yeah. And then it can jump out at you and it's contrasted with the change that has happened. Right. Um, I just found that very uplifting. Uh, yeah, no, this is exactly right. And this is where these old things become alive because they're the, they are the life of the community. They're the life of the story, the life of the politics of the church, and, we're, and you're lived into it. It's cool. Another guy who's done a lot of work with this, and I'll just put this name out here too. Some of you are familiar with him. You've read him already. James K.A. Smith. Um, teaches up at um, Calvin College in Grand Rapids. You guys familiar with him? Heard that? He's written a couple of books so far, Desiring the Kingdom and Imagining the Kingdom. Similar thesis in both of them. Um, he's another huge advocate of the liturgies of life and how we form things and how we, all of our life is liturgy and how we go through, you know, the, the liturgies of going shopping and you know, buying stuff and all this kind of stuff. That's Smith who does a lot of this. He tells a great story 
in his second book, Imagining the Kingdom, he tells a story about a father who has to go to a juvie lockup or, or jail somewhere because his kid is just totally messed up. And Smith tells the story very well. Um, and the kid comes to the father and just collapses in the father and says, you know, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. And he, you know, he's, he doesn't elaborate on what he's done, but he, he, he just, you know, the kid's sobbing and the father's angry and ticked off. But then when the father hears the confession from the kid, what does he do? He absolves him because that's what he's been trained to do. And it's the words of the liturgy, he starts to speak, I forgive you. Because that's what he has been lived into all his life. And the words just flow out of him without even having to think about it, because that's what you do. You see, that's the power of the formation that goes on. That's the power of this habituation that we're talking about, forming people into the life of the community. This is what you do. And you learn to see things in better ways. You learn to understand what you're seeing and what's going on. And you see things with the eyes of Christ. That's what we're training people to do. That's what it means to be a disciple. So, well, something that Howard Wass or Willeman brings up too, that James, that Smith brings up, is that if you're not forming your people, if you're not habituating them, well, guess who is? Yeah, absolutely. The world, the world is ex excellent at this and is doing it full tilt. And if you doubt me, think about the remarkable change that has happened in you guys' lifetime on the whole issue of gay rights and gay marriage. It's just extraordinary. The, the, the flip on this. And you guys are a little too young because you, you don't, you want to kind of see the tail end of this. But guys my age and Mike's age and y'all, we, we can remember the time when being, you know, homosexuality and gay was still kind of joked about and talked, you know, no, you know, it wasn't cool at all. Not at all. And now suddenly, you know, being gay is cool and it's like mainstream and it's great and nothing's wrong with it. And in fact, they're, they're better about stuff and that, hey, they're kind of, kind of cool. And they always have. And so how did this happen? How do you, completely change around the thinking of an entire culture in a single generation. How do they do this? How do they do this? Well, they habituated people into this and they were intentional about it. So you think about all the, you know, the, the mainstream media and the characters and sitcoms and dramas on TVs and in movies. How many of them have sympathetic gay characters who are the, really the moral, upright, cool people? You know, C countless. And so people begin to see, oh, look, they're not wrong, that's okay. And then they get taught this, you know, every individual has a right to do their own thing. Right, and who are you to tell somebody else how to do things? That's right. And so they start appealing to all these things. And it's remarkable how this can happen. And so what, where did this change happen? It's because the people in this country were habituated into thinking differently about it. And the world, of course, says, much better. Boy, that's a huge improvement. And we in the church are thinking, what's going on? And this is where you get the anger of people taking our world away from us or taking our church away from us, our country away from us. But it's, it's, it's an intentional and it's, it's overwhelming. And this is why the election is, and the results are not going to change anything, no matter what. It's not going to change the general direction of our culture. The culture is going full tilt on this course. And who is in power is not going to make that change. It's just not. While I agree that who's in power isn't going to make that change, I do want to make the point that this election and the way that it turned out, despite what the media was trying to push for, does show one thing, and that is, uh, to quote Dr. Meyer from our second year opening service, this is a doggone exciting time to be the church. Oh, it is. Because people are actually starting to push back against the media's agenda. Yeah, it's, we have to be really careful how what we mean by pushing back and what we're doing by this. And this is where we need to make sure we're paying attention to what we're, we're being called to do, which is be the church faithfully. Right. Be the church faithfully. It's not about power games. It's not about, right. My point is we have a, a great opportunity right well, now whether we, yeah, to be whether, able to show people a better way. Perhaps. And whether the church has got a majority of people with it or not, I don't really care. I just want the church to be faithful. And I think the church is probably going to be the minority if we get right down to it, because even those who are thinking they're being Christian probably aren't. And so that's what we need to face. And that's what I'm just trying to say. This is going to, this is, it's going to become the reality. It's going to settle in again is the world is already far down the road of individualism and opposition to God's ways of doing things. And that's not going to change. That's not going to change. Andy? Yeah, I, I feel uh, that this, the results of this election actually encourage a sort of complacency. Uh -huh. and, and that's what I'm afraid of. Yeah, I hear that. So mm -hmm. I, it is a great opportunity. I agree with that. Yeah. But you really do have to be the church. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Good. All right, what else you got in Howard Watch you wanted to talk about or ask about or things you're confused about? Yeah, Casey. Something I really appreciated 
was um, kind of the, the refocusing, so to speak, of the church's mission. Uh, I think so often uh, we, we ask the, the wrong questions in terms of mission and outreach. And I found, I found myself growing frustrated um, with our habits of trying to construct for ourselves an image of the person we're trying to reach so yeah. that we can more effectively uh, bring the gospel to them. And uh, basically, Howard Wasson will then put words to something uh, I've been feeling for a long time, but didn't know how to express that. So we're, we, we start to um, tailor the church's work and message and activity, trying to reach out and try to fit this ideal, this person we're trying to create, instead of just, in a sense, not caring about that individual and, and being who we are. Is that kind of what you're getting at? I don't want to put words in your mouth. Is that what no, you mean? that's, that's it. Yeah. See, I think this shows up especially like in things when we think about church programs or worship style and things like that. Well, what if an unbeliever comes in? What would they think? Or what if someone comes in who doesn't get it? We've got to think about them. And what bothers me is we end up making decisions for this person who may or may not even exist instead of simply being faithful to what we are and inviting people to participate in the life of this community. And what we need to cultivate then is an attitude in our own people of embracing and welcoming people into this. It's not a closed community. It's not a clique. We want people to come in, but it comes in on the terms that Christ has established. It's the story that's unique. There's a politics that you have to live into in this story. So, yeah, it's good. Matt? Yeah, I mean, I really resonated with this completely uh, reading it. Um, but I feel like... Uh, a guy like me, I could see. I could even easily see myself, and my wife's been like, "Hey, chill out." <laughs> when I start talking about this, because okay. I, get, I get excited, yeah. But can probably tend toward like the pietistic sort of uh, leaning. And I just kind of like well, find my balance and striking. That yeah, and so, culture. well, let's think about that. So maybe um, a little piety is not bad. Right. Pietism can be a problem, but piety is not bad. And the idea of the church actually looking increasingly different from the world around because we're just simply out of step with that, I don't, think, I don't have a problem with that either. Um, and this gets into another guy who you can read about if you want to, a guy named Rod Dreher. And he's an uh, advocate of something called the Benedict Option. And the Benedict Option is tying back to McIntyre's book, After Virtue, where ben, ben, McIntyre talks about this end of his book. And the Benedict is the guy who starts the monasteries, of course, St. Benedict, way back when. And Benedict does it to try to preserve truth and teaching and purity in the face of a decadent world. And so what Rod Dreher and others are suggesting with the Benedict option is maybe it's time for the church to start doing that as well and start establishing actually communities apart from the world. And this gets interesting. So do we build compound walls and go and live inside there and, you know, all graze our own chickens, you know, and stuff? Yeah. And there's something, frankly, about it that's kind of attractive. It's like, man, who wouldn't want to live in that? That'd be cool, actually. You know, there's something about that. But at the same time, we have to be careful that we don't cut ourselves off from the world because we are in the world and we have a responsibility to the world. And that's, that's that tension that has to remain there. But it's, it's, it, you're right. It is exciting. And so when your wife says, chill out, you think, okay, yeah, we'll keep some balance here. But man, there's something right about that, that tug into that kind of a thing. I'd agree with that. All right, who's next up? James? I, I was going to follow up more on the, tran I think his words were translating the world to the church or translating the church to the world. Right. And I, I like the incarnational idea of let's, let's look a little like the world. Not, not too much, mm -hmm. but enough to be accessible. Right. He's pushing totally against that. And that just made me uncomfortable. Yeah. I want to keep them both in balance. Right. And what, so his whole point is we don't have to make the church palatable to the world. We have to help the world see where they fit into the church. It's the, the question I, I kind of put it is what's the direction of fit? Are we trying to fit the church into the world? Or are we saying to the, to the world, you need to find your place here? Because this is the reality. And church should be courageous enough and, and in a sense, um, arrogant enough to say, we're the real story. You need to fit in here. We're not going to try to fit with you because you don't matter. It is a kind of a crazy thought because the church doesn't think that way, but we are called to, I believe. All right, so on the other hand, yep, Kevin. Um, so with, with what you said there and what we were talking about with Casey's question, uh, would you think the evangelism modules we do on Vicarage are kind of a waste of time then? Um, I don't know because I've not been on to one of your evangelism modules. Um, <laughs> And I, I, I didn't come to your ice cream social or to your whatever you did. Um, my, my suspicion is probably yes. Um, to be blunt, probably yes. Because um, when you start doing outreach, you know, events or, you know, things to, you know, 
you know, what are we really doing here? Evangelism is, by definition, the telling of the story of Christ. That's what it is. And being nice to people is great. And, you know, and getting, handing out water bottles at the fair, that's fine. You know, you can do that kind of stuff, but it's not evangelism. And the church needs to be more confident of the message it has and its responsibility to tell that message and equipping people to do that within their vocations. To me, the way that the church grew in the first century is the way the church should grow today, which is people simply live living the reality of Christ so exuberantly that they can't not be noticed. And then they invite people to come and join them in that world with them. And that's what makes the church grow. So in other words, we have a community that is faithfully following Christ. Then they go out to do all their, their life and their, all their vocations, but they do their vocations in such weird Christian ways that people can't help but notice. That's, what, that's the kind of organic growth that the church has always thrived in. And you see, what's cool about that is if the state takes away all of our privileges and all of our rights, can we still do that? Yeah, better than ever. And it's always good to remember that somehow or another, in the world of the first century, the church managed to grow. In spite of having privileges and buildings and clout, it managed to grow. In fact, it grew like gangbusters. And so we shouldn't ever be afraid of the world coming in on us. It's fine. Well, the church will be fine. All right. You might have to know how to make tents for a living, but you'll be fine. Play <laughs> bricks. Well. All right, what else you got? Um, he talked a little bit about, um, there was like, just kind of a mindset, I think, but um, instead of approaching issues like, say, abortion, where, oh, I voted for this or whatever, mm -hmm. maybe we, as a church, say, oh, this is not just your problem, as you're going to be a single mother, but this is our problem. That's right. And coming around these people. That's right. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I really appreciated that, because it's, taking away kind of this like my mindset that oh I voted for that so it's not really my age problem. that's right no we have to be much more invested in things it's kind of like I was getting at with the whole cohabitating couple so you have a couple who's cohabitating and you learn about this in many of your counseling sessions and so you ask the question you know what do you think God thinks of this oh, I think it's not very cool with this so then you just lay down the law you're right you're sinning against the sixth commandment I can't marry until you fix this go fix it no you say well, so what's stopping you why can't you? Let's figure out what God wants you to do. Oh, I think it wants to move apart. Right. Wow, we don't have money for that. Wow, we can help with that. And the church steps in. We can find you a place to live. We'll do this. And so you start investing in people. And you, you care about them. You make it possible for them to do what they need to do. You disciple them. You bring them along. So yeah, that's the idea. And so if you have an unwed mother in the congregation, instead of just making her feel bad, say, yeah, this was wrong. Sinned. This is stupid. But we need to care for you. And we're going to care for your situation and make it possible for you to carry this child to term instead of taking the easy way out. Right. So, the, so sh should Christians be involved in establishing houses and you know, ministries and providing material for unwed mothers to be able to carry their children or to have them and give them up for adoption? Yes, yes, yes. These are good things. Yeah. I just, I, uh, the parishioners in here were feisty and wonderful. Mm. And, um, well, especially the one who didn't think they should go to Disney World. Yeah, whatever. But like <coughs> some, of, some of them were kind of like, if you think about it, if we're taking his uh, approach, like these would be dream people to have in your midst. Mm -hmm. But yet sitting out here again, as we interact with this text, we're like, Gladys, what's wrong with you? Like, you shouldn't say things like that. Like you're, you're throwing the whole system, you know, yeah. but give um, me a hundred Gladys's. Right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So you don't, Tony, if you have a hundred of them, life will be kind of yeah. tough. Um, <laughs> but but they, yeah. they need to be herded. And talking stuff. about what he's talking about, there, you know, there's the section where uh, the people find out there's a 15-year-old that's pregnant in their church, and they say, anyway, well, let's take care of this. This is our issue. And a lot of times I feel like, what? Why are you getting into their business? Right. And they're like, it's, it's like leave our, it to the pastor. Right. This is all our business. We are in the business of each other. This is part of it. And now, and now you start to see how maybe lots of things start coming in here. So what's church discipline all about? Church discipline trying to just keep ourselves pure? No, it's caring for the body. That's why we do it. Kind of like remembering your name. Yeah. And, you know, like you've been baptized into a name. Who and are so, you? Are you acting like this? Are we acting like this? This is what we're being called to do. When somebody does something that has the same name as me, like that's a, I need to take care of that or I need that's to right. step in on that. That's right. So these are lofty, crazy ideals. And I encourage you not to sell yourself short and don't sell the church short. You will have a Gladys, I think, in every congregation, somebody who actually takes this stuff seriously and wants to do it. They need just to be encouraged and, and help them realize this is what we're here to do. Let's do this. And you're going to have people who are going to get really nervous about this and people who will find it offensive. And they'll just walk down the road and find another church that's much more palatable. 
There's plenty of those around. Don't be one of those. You know, so it's not a matter of, and but it's not a matter of just being a jerk. Being a jerk is wrong, but it's a matter of being faithful and calling people to a higher standard and to a, a life of discipleship. And isn't that why you came to the seminary in the first place? I suspect that's why most of you are here. So Howard Wass is calling you back to your nobler, fundamental roots. Let's do what I came here to do. I want to. I want to make a difference in the world. And that's what Howard Wass is calling you to do. Maybe it'll be with three people, but go do it. Help those three people. All right. Good. Anything else? All right. So enjoy the um, break and have a nice quarter ahead and all that stuff. So.